has arrived. So we're going to go ahead and get started momentarily. There's a little bit of setup to do here still, but um, thank you all for joining us tonight for this presentation as part of our old growth celebration here at the library. Um, thank you for your patience and waiting. Uh, we're really excited to be doing this um, this month at the library, and I need to say thank you to several folks, including um, and especially Eric Jensen, the art student who worked with us for this. This was definitely Eric's idea, and it's been just um, a really great project to see um, come into being with his ideas. Um, also, thank you so much to Diana Six for helping and uh, consulting a lot with this, and to Spectrum for also partnering with the library for this program. Uh, and thanks also to MCAT for being here to record. So uh, at the end, if we've got time for questions, one of us will come by with the mic so that all the folks in TV land that we'll be watching can hear your awesome questions. So, also um, here to introduce Rick is Professor Sarah Jones, and she is going to say a bit when we're ready. Okay, hi, thanks for staying. This is gonna be awesome. Eric, thank you for pulling this together. Um, so tonight, we are welcoming Rick Bass, um, and Rick is um, an author of more than 30 books and a wilderness advocate. Um, he has long been considered one of the most gifted practitioners of the short story. I have to keep this right in my face. Um, he's originally from Texas got a degree in geography, no, geology, geology at Utah State, um, worked in the field for, I think, more than seven years, and eventually became the writer that he is and a teacher. And he has taught at the University of Texas at Austin, Beloit, University of Montana, Pacific University, Iowa State, and probably more places. Um, he's the recipient of numerous awards, including fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Lindhurst Foundation, and the Montana Arts Council. Um, his stories and essays have appeared in the Paris Review, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and numerous other periodicals. Um, Rick lives in the Yak Valley um, in uh, northwest Montana. Um, he works with the Yak Valley Forest Council and has dedicated a huge part of his life to protecting the old growth forest in the Yak Valley. So please welcome Rick Bass. A new word in the English language, any language, for the kind of apology you make when you're an hour. You're going to have to use the mic. There should be a word in our language <laughs> for when you're an hour late to your own uh, thing. Uh, if I knew that word, I would use it right now. I've been using other words since I found out that it was late, but I won't share them. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah. Um, really grateful to Sarah and Eric for, for having me in on this, this Earth Week and for the work y'all are doing for Old Can't Force. Hear you without the mic. You have two mics. Oh. Is that one on? Oh, right. Gotcha. No. It's not on. Thank you. I turn this off. Yes. Yeah. Is that any better? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, simple things like get to the library when you're expected. Speak into the microphone. Let's start over. Thank you, Eric and Sarah, for having uh, me in as part of your, your old forest advocacy and protection and celebration week. Um, I'm up in the Yak Valley and I'm really excited. I told uh, Corky Claremont that. With Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribe, that we've done some art projects with the museum together, and I was excited uh, to show the uh, the guitar that was made out of a piece of really old spruce from up there. I told Corky it was at seven, um, 
So that was in the back of my mind when I, in the thir- 23 minutes since I found out it was at six, well, well, at least I didn't mess Corky up, but I messed all of y'all up. Again, apologies. Um, Dick Manning is gonna play the guitar. I don't really know where to begin with this story, so I'm just gonna read some um, essays that I wrote about before this guitar was made by Kevin Kopp over in Bozeman. And then uh, Dick is going to let y'all know, hear what it sounds like, and he's going to talk about guitars and uh, an old forest or old forest wood, and I hope I'll be able to answer some questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, this is not political. This is just a picture of the, the administration that was under the, when this sale, this proposed sale came up. This is like, I don't know how to make him go away. Oh wait, no I do. Um, okay, good. I'm gonna read a section, um, a, a short essay about how the guitar came to be, and then I'll show these slides. It was the first year of the great dying. And while we didn't think it would be gone by Easter, that day when the great bear rolls back her boulder and re-enters the born again world of spring, we did tell ourselves that all the bad things would end. It was a year, I think, in which some things bent but did not always break. Though I also know now there could be great glory in the breaking. It was a year I walked again and again into the old forest for strength and something else. I walked carefully across the tops of fallen giants, the spongy carcasses continuing to give long after the trees themselves had all but disappeared. What if for a tree or for any of us, there is no end really to the living? The old forest at the top of the Yak Valley is where water first comes into Montana. Up here in the Yak is as far north and west as you can go and still be in this country. It's where the sun is last seen each day in this state. Does a tree have a voice? Every living thing has a voice, or should. Of all the living creatures, wood has the best voice for the voice of wood has a life beyond itself. Wood vibrates, resonates forever, physicists say, with all the sound it has ever generated or received. The wood has a memory. Does it know what's coming? It is said that the rain falls equally on the just and the unjust, and that may be true but different angles of light fall differently on every object in the world, upon the living and the unliving. Some are gilded with it, others scorched. Some are starving for it and others may receive too much. But water, everyone needs the same amount of water. Water, unlike light, can and does go away. The old forest up in the Yak is the place through which our first water flows being distributed to the East Fork, the West Fork, the North Fork, and the South Fork, into Zulu Creek, Zero Creek, Mule Creek, Wincombe, Midge, Hawkins, and so forth. It births, splays Montana's first river into outstretched shimmering radials of life. The old forest gives us all the water we could ever want, but in exchange, we must protect the temple where it begins. It originates in a mind-bogglingly complicated forest, but it's not a complex relationship. It gives water. We give the old forest respect. The light does not fall on us equally. Those at the top of a hill, for example, receive and bathe in it earlier and later. They have it both ways. The sweet secret things down in the lowlands wait for justice and wait and keep on living like a voice caught forever in the wood. A small group of us, the Yak Valley Forest Council, rebels, poets, dreamers, scientists, has recommended the government create a climate refuge up here in the far northwest of Montana, in the last place the ice left long ago. It's the last place the fire will come to. 
We believe it's a place to study the effects of climate change, not a place to erase. This one forest, what the Forest Service now calls Unit 72, there's no other way to talk about it but spiritually. Like Noah's Ark, it still has at least two of everything. Salamanders, grizzlies, owls, lynx, lions, caribou down from the north. Like the Garden of Eden, this is a place that has not yet known the bruising hand of man. There are large parts of Unit 72, I prefer to call it the old forest, that have never known fire. The forest floats atop a perched water table. The forest guards the water just below. What lies within the bark of these 800-year-old larch? In the assemblage of secret chemistries, whirring at the base of giants might be more data than our computers could ever handle. But we can listen for it. We can listen to it and know it in that manner. It is a floating forest of hummocks and frost pockets stippled with fairyland fins and miniature marshes. This old forest is self-regulated for nearly a thousand years by a little known phenomenon called gap creation. The forest feeds upon itself and upon that light, upon that water. When the spruce and subalpine fir become old, they crash down, not like as if from an ax blade before they are ready, but with a shower of light that is in step with time and reason down through the overstory, creating a gap, and into that gap the light rushes, and from that gash life surges, as it did on the first day. All of the seven days of creation can be found in this forest in any one moment. It is a great and perpetual floating orchestra of light and sound and life, and a kind of eternal dying that is not at all a dying does color make a sound? Does the light that falls upon us? I believe it does, that the waves of light shooting toward us from the sun, rays sent out toward us so long ago we give them their own beautiful term, light years, create a sometimes unique and other times familiar sound, notes and chords as each wave shimmers and oscillates, each one sliding along against the others next to it. Some are silky and others raspy. Some are fragmented, others supple with the joy of the living. But yes, light makes music. Anyone knows that. It is said among some communities in the far north, the aurora borealis makes a sound that only children can hear and that the northern lights can be summoned come closer when children whistle back to them. We, the Yak Valley Forest Council, went in ahead of the devastation, ahead of the Forest Service's plans to clear cut nearly a thousand acres of ancient forest. The Forest Service had already begun the defiling, had painted their pitiful offering of leaf trees in orange and blue, directing the sawyers where to go and not go. Only the garishly painted trees, one or two per, one or two per acre, would be spared though after all the others were gone, even the painted ones would die, unable to survive their sudden isolation. And meanwhile, the loggers would slay every other living thing that did not have the mark upon it. We went in behind them, trying to undo the humiliation. A forest must stand together, or it is not a forest. But they kept coming back and painting over our brown paint. A tree, much less an old forest, was not made to be painted. The one we found, the chosen one, was big, but had taken centuries to get that way. 312 years, give or take a couple of sunrises. It would have been a single cotyledon at first, a sun-warmed seed, a single idea, with no sound at all. Who knows who its parents were? In that sense, the guitar we make out of it will be an orphan too, but in another sense, it belongs to all of us, for whoever hears its voice shall forever after carry that trembling, that music within. Before it came to us, before we came to it, this 150-foot-tall Engelmann spruce grew on a steep shaded bank through which a creek used to run before the Forest Service gashed the creek to let it bleed out. All the subsurface water clutched by all the ancient roots 
seeped out into the gash and was carried away down the muddy logging road beneath the now blazing sun. That slash is what brought a desert to the very edge of the old forest. A storm had tossed the spruce over. When we cut the giant open, taking only a single vertebrae, we could smell the music that would come, could feel it even before the luthier first laid his hand to it. There was and still is joy in the wood. I guess that sounds funny. What does joy sound like? But really, how could any living thing be in that forest for 312 years and not be comprised of joy or even the thing that lies beyond joy? a thing we may not yet have a name for. The tree had been lying down for some time when we came to it, but we could still feel the sound in it as surely as you could the heartbeat of an immense animal. The growth rings were so close together, like a closed fist gripping the music, not letting go until we came for it, until we were ready for it. It felt odd taking even a single piece of wood from that perhaps doomed forest. Like all great things, it had a tiny hairline crack in its center. We could see that once we went in with our tools. The wound had been held tightly almost from the very beginning. It was a shock to see that which some might think of as a scar or blemish within. What possible good can ever come from all this pain? The weakness the spine around which the body wraps, the weakness that hides deepest within a person, within a tree or a nation. Surely one day, surrounded by the slow music of time, that tree or human or nation comes to think it is finally safe and that the hidden crack is no longer a weakness, has vanished. It never vanishes, it just becomes hidden. We bathed it with water from the river. We bathed it as if anointing it with oils as we prepared it for its next journey. How long ago its birth seemed. The year would have been 1709. Europeans would have just arrived. Pilgrims back east wearing those funny shoes, witches and pointed hats. Oh wait, maybe they weren't witches. For when they were tied up and burned alive, they did not unfasten their bonds and fly away. Though maybe they did. I hope so. We've seen some things in this country, this tree and those of us who are still here. And all this time, it's been waiting to speak. A virus is not a living thing. It's more of a mechanical thing, a scrambled sheath of proteins, which, like a living thing, is just seeking a place in the world. Why are they in the world? Why do they want to latch on to us, use us, get what they can from us, then move on to the next? That is perhaps more of a spiritual or even religious question than it is one of evolutionary biology. It's not hard to identify a virus. It's small, sure, but you can see it under a microscope. A virus is and yet is not like an idea, beauty, say, or wealth, an abstraction, one where, when you look under the microscope, you see nothing. You can't see the idea, but it's gotten inside you. We're trying to build a guitar from this ancient forest before the Forest Service, the Kootenai National Forest, erases it from the earth, erases it from everything but memory. The wellspring, gone. Green, wet life turned to hot dust. They say that it, the clear cutting will make the old forest resilient. They are saying the forest is in danger and must be protected from itself. They are saying they know a way with their bulldozers to make the forest better. This is the birthplace of the wild yak. It is also the place in Montana to which all life can retreat and take shelter during the great burning. It is the most beautiful place and the most mysterious and for both of these reasons, possibly the most dangerous, feared, reviled by some. It was the time of great dying and the time in which metaphor went away. I can't breathe, the man kept saying. Have we become so accustomed to ugliness that we fear all beauty? I'm afraid of the answer. 
Again and again, I go into the old forest while it is still here more than an idea. I go there quietly to listen. Everything trembles. Music was here long before we were. Listen, listen harder. I have two, two short pages I'm going to read now that are aligned with these slides. Most of these slides are by Anthony South of the Yakima Forest Council, our Headwaters Restoration Coordinator. Um, the bear slides in it are from Brad Orsted from Gardner. It's like Noah's Ark up here, biblical. A refuge. Nothing's gone extinct despite the previous administration's attempts otherwise. So there are more connections up here. We don't understand them, but we feel comforted in their midst. Even in a time of war, we feel safe. It was the year of the great dying, and we went into the forest as if summoned, listening. We'd received a letter from the government saying the old forest at Black Ram was going to be cut down to make it more resilient, to teach it manners. We wandered. We walked softly on emerald mosses didn't look up much. You can't see all that's above, only below. We lay down on the moss and slept. We dreamed. We woke. <coughs> Heaven is beneath our feet as well as above. <coughs> Excuse me. There no longer is any metaphor. For a week or so, all our roads are covered in gold. Our streets are lined with gold, here and now. We saw the light coming down as a miracle. The waves of light are no different than waves of music. In the old forest, time behaves differently. It seems to us to have stopped. What is rot but slow fire? The light started toward us long ago. It's only now finding us. In this old forest, you can hear the light. In olden times, when a person went mad, they'd be tied to a tree beside a rushing river and listen to it until they healed. The giants in here grow out of the hearts of fallen giants, which grew out of the hearts of the giants before them. This place is a carbon miracle. It holds the carbon in safekeeping through the centuries. What is old growth? This forest is so old it doesn't even show up on the Forest Service's charts. They can't see it. Their eyes are blinded. In my father's mansion, there are many rooms, says one prophet. I would not have made such a place without you in mind. A tree without a forest is not a tree. The tree without a forest will die. Sun scald, wind shear, and grief. Our grief is not the only grief in the world. All things are connected. Water and light equals life. Water, light, life, and earth equals rot. Water, life, light, and rot equals soil. Water and light equals music. Nature abhors a straight line. There is always music in the soil. There is always music being created in the wood. When you touch the wood, you can feel it like sunlight before you can hear it before it comes out. 
We went into the ruination and salvaged one vertebrae of ancient spruce to make the perfect guitar. On it, our country's greatest musicians will play songs of resistance and hope. From it, the old forest will speak. The old forest will sing. The guitar has been silent all these centuries. We want a guitar that will defend the old forest. We selected the wood that held the music we needed. We want a miracle. We will work for a miracle. What is time but the fundament of miracles? If we were to walk into a frozen field late in March and be told those who slept beneath it, our feet, beneath our feet as if dead, would return, would we not call that a miracle? Winters are still long in the yak. Winter to spring, breath to breath. If it happens fast, we call it a miracle. If it takes centuries, we don't see it. And here we are in the middle, still unseeing and still unhearing. We are not the only ones who love black ram. Are we the crop or the gardener? This is only our first day in the garden. Everything we see, touch, taste, smell, here is a miracle, here for but an eye blink. They aerate the soil with daggered claws. Lilies grow where they walk. They roll boulders aside and life emerges. They lick the ants like sprinkles on ice cream. They scratch the soil and wildness rushes out, greeting the light with all of us in the middle. The yaks, frogs, and salamanders need black ram too. There are only three mother grizzlies with cubs left. There must be two of everything. One story reminds us. Our hearts remind us. What is a miracle, really? In the old forest, our relationship with time changes. The old forest tells us, slow down. We're all but a blink. We all sip from the headwaters in which sparkle flecks of gold so that we are made of cold. W.S. Merwin wrote, I want to tell what the forests are like. I will have to speak in a forgotten language. It was the year of the great dying. We went into the old forest to sleep and into the old forest to awaken. Listen, listen harder. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dick, will you share what it sounds like? It, it, it feel, it, I called it it, which really feels awkward because I've been calling it her. And I, uh, <laughs> she does not have a name. We're, we're hoping, uh, just waiting to, for a name to come. Uh, and it, we just don't feel confident to make a name up. Uh, but she is a she, I know that. And I'll be driving around with her in the back seat. and. Um, She's like a child back there. She, you just know she's back there. And I'll go in the house and think, I'm, I left something in the car, and go back out and get, and she's just a presence. And uh, yeah, Dick can talk about her. And Dick just picked her up about 30 minutes ago. And uh, yeah, um, it, exactly. I just. Exactly, how's my level back there? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, uh, how's that? If we can make this work. Um, yeah, I, I, I picked this up 30 minutes ago, literally. Well, not literally now, but close. And I, I've been talking to Rick all winter about it. And I've known this project was in the works, but I've been incarcerated in Washington, D.C. for the last six months. And only got here to this end of the world. The first I've seen Rick since I went away. So I'm very excited to see it. 
And, and as soon as I picked it up, I said, what the hell, Rick? Why didn't you tell me it was a Nick Lucas? Because, you know, um, this mock, this is a venerated uh, mock a style of guitar that goes back to about 1929, named for Nick Lucas, who was a crooner back then. He wrote Tiptoe Through the Tulips. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And uh, so, they, so this model has been around forever. And, and, they're, and that's the thing with guitars. You know, Rick started out talking about the wood. And if you look at the wood here, the growth rings and what's going on here, that's, that's encoding a story. And it's that history of that guitar. But that only begins when the guitar was built. And you saw Kevin Cox shaving the braces up there. What he was doing is not just cutting them to size. He was tuning them. And so each piece of wood is different. And he's making each pitch just right to bring out the right notes at the top. And Kevin is a master at it. We were very fortunate to have two world-class, at least two world-class luthiers working in Montana. One is Kevin. One is a guy who talk, taught him, who is John Walker, who works at Alberton. You can call literally a boutique guitar shop in Paris and mention the name Kevin Cobb, and they know him. So it's, it's no joke. And he's, he's really good. But at any rate, the story starts as soon as you pick up one of these guitars. And it's our job, the guy, the people who play them, understand that right away. And that you need to put more stories into them. And it just goes on and on. Or and I've got one guitar that's 100 years old. I play that, and every time I pick it up, it's just shocking to me. The stories it knows. But it turns out that the life history of the wood means a lot to what they sound like. But so does the life history of the guitar itself. How it's played, who plays it, what kind of music do they play, what do they bring to it. It, it changes the guitar over time. And by the time they're 100 years old, they actually become something. This one's only less than a year old. No. At any rate, Rick brought us a lot of beauty out uh, from the forest and, and, and a lot of majesty from the forest. And I sat back there saying, oh shit, um, I don't know any pretty music. <laughs> and I feel like I should play pretty music on this thing, but I play blues. <laughs> that's, that's and what, what do you do? I know, but I do it because of the stories, because other stories go back to the 1890s. And, um, some of them, some of the songs I play, because I love them. That's my access to history. The history in the top of this guitar and the history in the songs themselves. And I said, well, what in the hell am I going to play on this guitar that will rise to the occasion? And I remember, um, uh, there's, a, there's a famous song written on a Nick Lucas, this exact shape and size guitar from, made by Gibson. But it was recorded in the early 60s. And then I saw my second friend Abramson back there, and I said, yeah, I can do a Dylan tune. That'll be all right. It won't work. So I'm going to do a Dylan tune. Bob Dylan played a guitar exactly like this all through the 60s. You can see it on the Penny Decker film. And it also speaks to what Rick was talking about, because this tune is called Girl from the North Country. It seems to be a pretty good name for a guitar. It's going to take me a minute to get into this, and I said I almost saw it a half hour ago. Traveling in that no country fair. Wind blows heavy there on the borderline. I want you to remember me. What is it say? She once was a Traveling where no snowflake falls, rivers freeze and summer gone. I want you to see for me where they cold so warm. Keep her from that. Curls 
it fall all down her breast? Don't you see for me her hair's hanging down? That's the way I remember it then. but mostly the execution of it. And Kevin is known for the fact he picked his guitars up the first time and they sound like old guitars already. Okay. And, and that's no small feat, and not many people can do that. But he does it, and it's the balance, it's in the tone, there's nothing that's overwhelming. And, and, um, and it's it responsiveness and the, and the laser-like focus of the notes, which is something that's in a tradition that goes back with Gibson guitars largely for about a hundred years. I love hearing the guitarist walk out like this. Uh, the uh, Gibson Hartwell picked it up and said something similar. It opened up even as he was playing it, like just out of the box. When Kevin gave the guitar to us, he said, take good care of it, it's really important. Whoever plays it first needs to be really good because that person's gonna teach the guitar. How to, how to sound and, and the guitar will in turn teach the guitarist how, it want, how she wants to be played and uh, it becomes a conversation which is just, I don't understand this but I love hearing them talk about it, I love hearing y'all talk about it. Yeah, it, that's a fact, oddly enough. And, and, and so, so much of music now is um, electric, electronic, made by computers, that's all anybody hears anymore. You know, on, on cheap speakers or in arena rock and things like that. And it's lost the capriciousness of the history and the, the detail of acoustic instruments. So very few people have heard acoustic instruments be what they can be. And it is quite phenomenal. You, you build a relationship with your guitar that goes on for many years and, 
finally, 10 years in, you find it's teaching you something. It just told you something how you ought to play. And you, you have not been listening until now. And part of what you're listening to are those growth rates that were laid down 200 years ago. That, that's really what's happening. So it's, it's, it's a humbling experience. And he said that whoever plays it first has to be really good. I didn't play it first, I promise. <laughs> It was Dick is who gave me the idea about making a, a guitar out of old spruce from the yak. Dick has a, a, a cop, and again, I just, he showed it to me. I just held it. It was just, I hope that I could hear my fingers touching the wood. It was so uh, amazing. And then he, he had a couple of strings on it. And it just, I've learned the language. They say it's a fast attack and a slow decay. Is that, yeah. so that's what it was like. Like they'd make the note, and it was just like, go all through you and then it would keep going and you would just it would just keep living for a long time after usually you stop hearing something i don't know if you were still feeling it or hearing it but i i thought okay well i know where there's some old spruce and, and uh, yeah so that's dick and you're, you're totally her godfather if not <laughs> uncle yeah well, and, and there's something else interesting i want to talk about the project itself uh, because Rick's been talking to me about the the, the, the the lobby problem that he's having up in the United Valley for years now. And you know, I listened to it and I said, yeah, that's kind of bad. Um, but you know, it's this isolated case in the Yak Valley and there are worse things happening in the nation. He showed you a picture of Trump earlier on and you know, that was during that period saying there are worse things going on. I've gotten educated on that, that problem over the last six months or so. And what's happening is that this is not isolated. That attitude of, oh, there's small growth trees, we gotta go save them from nature, and we're gonna go log back so it will be resilient, it is now percolating up through the Forest Service in a big way in this administration. And if we are not careful, they are going to inventory the last of the old growth. In fact, they've already done it, and they're going to walk. And it's an issue. And so the problem that Rick is looking at is not isolated at all. There's an attitude, and it's not it's not administration wide, but it's Forest Service wide right now. It's percolating up front of Forest Service that simply says, you know, and look at managing. Well, we got to manage for the future in some way to save the forest. Not once thinking of all the goddamn management mistakes they have made less over the last one one hundred years. Not once. And things like fire suppression and that have gone on and the roading in the forest and the, plant, and the planting and plantations, all that stuff, they have not gained the humility to understand we should not be doing that. And it's it's bubbling up a lot faster than ever. Wow, yeah, like Dick is Dick always beats you in the bush, he never tells it straight. <laughs> Still, yeah. No, it's, it's rough up there. We're, uh, we're proposing this ancient forest become a, a climate refuge where it will be dedicated toward growing and keeping old growth. The Yak historically, what they call the historic range of variability was as much as 50% old growth. And uh, now it's down around 10%. So that's kind of an ambitious project. It's gonna take hundreds of years to bring it back to balance with what the shape of the land and the way the light falls on that land and the hydrologic cycles and the species interaction with the soil and the trees. It's not going to come back quickly, but it can come back and, and the place that this place where it has not been, it's a primary forest, never been touched in any way, is it's different. I mean I've been wandering around the Yak for almost forty years and, and uh, I've never seen a place like this forest and I mean it's just uh, it it's messy, you know, it's not that classic uh, understory where there's just no where the light never reaches and so there's no growth down there there's Can you some, use that mic please oh <clears throat> oh it says it's, it's on is that better yeah also i lower I, I i start to mumble when i start getting discouraged so that could be part <laughs> um anyway I, we've held off we've held this sale off for many years uh, but like dick says they they they're coming, it's a test case. 
It's the fo poster forest for old and mature forests and how they can hold carbon and biological diversity. And it's also the test forest for uh, the timber lobby that says we're going to make a, we're not going to be backed off of this. We, it's, it's not the way I wanted it to go, but it's where we are. So uh, we'll do our best and really uh, appreciate y'all's help in this, this battle, which uh, is not yet lost and is not yet won. Um, I feel good. We're getting a lot of lucky breaks, and that's usually a good sign that it's not all in, up to you, that there's some larger desire in the world that wants it, but we still have to put in the sweat equity in the hours. Uh, and and I, it just, I feel instinctively, if we can turn toward things of joy and things we love and celebrate, that will be unbeatable. Like, you know, climbing to the tops of the trees, which we will do as the last measure, uh, is a, hasn't worked. So I think this feels, this feels, uh, it feels revolutionary having Dick play the girl from the North Country on it. Uh, I, we would like anybody who has a song that they think the guitar, who would like the guitar to know, to email us and, and we're gonna, you know, be giving it to her education, you know. Uh, I, I made a mistake, uh, I took it to uh, Maine where I, I do some teaching and a couple of, uh, Deb Markbart, Jenny O'Connell, and instructors, but also musicians, uh, they took her for an evening and taught her all the songs they wanted her to know. And, and when I said, what did, what did you teach her? They wouldn't tell me. So I think it was like naughty aunties or something. But, uh, <laughs> they didn't tell her what all she knows already. But, uh, it's a fun thought, like, you know, what, what songs of resistance and, and change uh, from our country are good for her to start learning and be being played a hundred years from now. Um, yeah. And I, how that's going to protect Black Ram, I don't know, but we've had a lot of musicians around the country say that they want to uh, play the song in their in their homes. And I hope by word of mouth, it'll just get around and musicians cheer through here. They'll say, hey, where's that Black Ram guitar? Yes? It seems like this would be such a wonderful opportunity for somebody who makes videos to do to follow the guitar around and document that and the stories and how that ties back to protecting old growth i it seems like you could throw that out as a pitch to to somebody that's really good and they would bite thank you for your your optimism and for the idea we've been trying to but we're limited capacity we haven't had success yet but i'm hoping by word of mouth or if anybody here knows you know videographer that uh that i'll send you some names thank you yeah fantastic I, thank you that'd be exciting so a little bit of education for us that are I mean, what's the incentive to go for a bold growth if it's such a small percentage and there's so much stuff if you just want lumber and wood that you have to go for old growth? What, 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 yeah, here's, what the, the, here's the argument that's emerging. I mean, there are two levels of this. One is Speak the up a little bit, would you? Here, here, it's hard. I'm it's on. Hard to hear you. Thank you. Okay. So here, there, there are two levels of that. One is the incentive, the, the, the word you use, and that's a good one. Oh, no, louder. Uh, louder? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Put it closer to your mouth. I'm going to pull it up a little bit. How's that? Better? Okay, so the question was, what's the incentive to go for old growth right now? And my answer said it was on two levels. One is incentive. It's a good word for this. And anytime you throw money into a bureaucracy, they're going to find some way to spend it. And there's a lot of money right now through the... Um, Inflation Reduction Act, In incredible amounts of money flowing into the, the bureaucracies, especially the Forest Service and the Department of Interior. We say, well, hey, that's money to do good with. Well, in the bureaucracy, they don't care if it's good or not as long as it gets spent. And, as long, and especially with the Democratic administration, there are all these incentives to create jobs locally. So if we can spend that money on the ground, all the better. Nothing wrong with any of that. But what this did like, I am using the mic, um, it, and it, it's going to feed back. Let me move this up just a little bit. Oh, great. You can use this one. 
Good. You got that one? I'll, I'll do that one. How's that? You have this? <laughs> Just one. Yeah. Let me shut this one off so we don't get some feedback. Thank you. See, that's, I'm a lousy roadie. You know, I can set this up. <laughs> Um, so you asked about incentive, I'm sorry, and so the bureaucracy has incentive to go for old group because it's a good way to spend money, and, and they, they're talking about thinning, and the word they use on it is... I think the mic went off. How can the mic go off? I didn't do the same thing. Just one, two, three, no. No. You broke it. I can cover the screen. I was probably being censored. <laughs> How's this one? Perfect. All right. So the, the incentive is to spend that money in any way you can, and that that's what they're doing. They're spending money, but they targeted old growth because they have making the argument that thinning will somehow help that forest. And so the forest it got there by the hand of nature over 500 years, and all of a sudden it needs loggers in there to, to help it get to the next 500 years. But uh, 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 it's just simply a way to spend money, and they're arguing that the resilience is necessary for climate change. So because we're facing a lot of forests now, the, or I'm sorry, for a lot of fires now, the thing they have to do is go in and thin the forest. When in fact, any fire scientist will tell them, you know, the real problem is 100 feet around your house, not the old growth forest at all. But nonetheless, it's an excuse to do it. it, it it's, such a great question. Yeah. Pardon me? Yes, it is such a great question. Yeah, it really is. And, and, and the thing about it is, some of the people who are doing it are doing it with the best of intentions. They actually believe they're helping those forests become resilient. And that's just frightening. Because because that's even worse than the money crisis sometimes because it's not. We took we took the supervisor. Is this on again? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. It goes off and on. Put my mic in. Okay. We took we took the supervisor, the forest, the Cootie National Forest, into the woods to say, hey, this is old. You need to look at this, and we thought he would just pull that unit and he, he he didn't he looked around and, and said no it's 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 good to, good to go we're going to clear cut it uh i mean you're walking over the carcasses of giant you know water squeaking squishing out of the logs when you step on them you see uh giants on top of giants on top of giants until they get so faint you're not sure you can even see the outlines and uh just so much moss over over everything. I've never been in a forest like that. But again, to answer your question directly, it's become um, it's become a an ideological battle. Uh, they're going to try and cut it because they said they were going to cut it, and they're going to they're not going to be told what to do unless it's by court. And uh, you know that great remake of the movie True Grit uh, by the Coen Brothers, where the Texas Ranger shows up on the trail of the, the outlaw Tom Cheney. And uh, Matty Ross has got the sheriff trying to catch Tom Cheney, and now this Texas Ranger's trying to catch Tom Cheney. And the Texas Ranger says, what does it matter to you if he hangs for uh, killing your father or for this fracas down in Texas? And, and Matty Ross says something like this, I want him to hang for killing my father. I do not want him to hang for killing a senator's bird dog. And I mean, that's how I feel about this Black Ram project. I don't want to win in court. I want, I want him to stop because it's wrong, uh, but it's just become a, a head-butting thing. Uh, these northern forests, the coniferous forests, the, where these wet soils, these swampy soils are the best on earth at storing carbon. 19, 000, you may have already gone over this area, a good 19,000 metric tons per hectare. An Amazonian rainforest, just 2,500 metric tons per hectare. We have got gold in Montana up there, and they're racing to erase it before. They're inventorying it, and then racing to get rid of it. Uh, before we can even study it. There's never been any studies in there. Why didn't this forest burn? Uh, why are these 800-year-old large year remnants from the last period of, of warming? Uh, I, I, need the, I need the guitar. I need her to remember. Yeah, not I, 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 
will be closing in 11 minutes. Please make your final selection. Stay tuned to the checkout area. Please return to laptops at this time. Those using meeting rooms, please and your meeting, clean up and vacate the room. Thank you. He, 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 sounds, like, he sounds like he means it. Oh. Is there any uh, classification, is there any links designation or habitat there, there that you could use? There, 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 yeah, there's, well, I, I don't want to presume success, but there, yes, there's Lynx Habitat. It's designated Core Grizzly Habitat. I don't want to spend this lovely evening and y'all come in and see slides and hear beautiful music. I just don't want to be cracking the whip on, you know, name calling up there, but it's, it's, it's breathtaking and it's, it's been breathtaking for seven Montana years. That uh, doing this, so it's a, well, it is. This stand conversion idea, like Dick was saying, they're going to, they want to clear cut 754 acres to protect us from fire. It's 20 miles north. It's on the Canadian border. It's downwind. There's no fire on this earth. It's going to go up there and come into the wind and downslope and into town. It's going to go where the wind goes. It's going to feed on the oxygen. Um, and and to say that then they want to replant it with pine and larch because the world is going to get hot and dry. And these trees, these old cedar, this ancient hemlock, uh, subalpine so fir, they won't live another thousand years because it's going to get hot. So they're going to go in and just get them anyway and then plant the trees of the future. But then they say, well, when we plant these piney larch, because it's a swamp, probably only 10% of them are going to make it. It's madness. I mean, I don't want to name call, but it's just... Um, anyway, it's, it's going to work out great. It's going to work out great. Um, I'm not just saying that. It's just we're getting some good breaks. So. But we need add, more. Just a bit to that, and I just figured out my microphone problems. And I'm, I think, can you hear me now? Okay, so I, 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 the answer that I wanted to give you, Rick just brought up, which was the word fire. And this is what we're not understanding in our politics right now that we're fighting the battle from the last timber wars 30 years ago and so forth, and for Bert Zerbin But what this is really about is fire and acceptance of chaos. And the American public is not geared to accept chaos, period. They will not do it. And they'll say they'll do it until their houses start burning down. And then they go to their Congress people and say, that's got to stop right now. Do anything you can to stop it. And they will do anything they can to stop it. So any, any of those majors that Rick is talking about, about controlling fire is what this is all about. And the battle now is to say, no, we can't control fire. We can't, and we can't control the chaos that's going to come from global warming. We're going to have to learn to roll with these punches a little bit. And it's a very hard sell to the American public, but it's the, it's the only avenue we've got. So we're entering a new era of politics, and the politics are going to look very different than they did a generation ago. Who do we talk to? Who do we ask questions to? Who do we, who will listen that has any power? Or has that influence, let's put it like. Um, Chester, is he listening? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but Chester, um, Chester's in cycle right now. Yeah. So he's going to have to say what people want to hear. That's what happens when anybody's in cycle. And what they want to hear is we're going to put those fires out. No Montana wants to hear we're going to let these things burn. We're going to let them well, put them out. Put them out British Columbia first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, seriously. Um, uh, uh, so Missoula County is now about to start a pilot program where they're going to do the right thing. And, and the right thing is thinning around houses as opposed to the old growth forest and zoning and requiring building materials that if you live up into the forest, you're responsible for making your house fireproof. So you can start by talking to Dave Strohmeyer at, at Missoula County and say, you know, we support that. What can we do to get the message out? What, what is the messaging that needs to happen? Also understand your federal government is split. And so you talk within the federal government to the people who understand what's going on. The better, the better audience for this message is the Department of Interior right now. Not the force. Can you repeat the last few words, the better audience? The better audience is the Department of Interior right now. And I don't want to sound I don't want to sound too old fashioned, but talking to your neighbors, I mean it's a small state and everybody knows someone who knows someone. Just like Dick was talking about guitars and stories, just get this story out there. One of the reasons uh Black Ram was even dreamed up is because the National Forest up there 
feels like they can get away with it because they're not illuminated. It's on its way on the corner. It is literally on the Canadian border. Uh, and yeah, I, I just think if it becomes known and illuminated, uh, it won't stand. So we do have to get out, but you guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.